Alrighty, okay, so um, all right, so the, the thing I wanted to get through today was uh, this manif complexity manifesto. So what, what is this, you know, this story of complex systems? So just the, the you know, just the basic uh, um, idea behind this frame, it's a framing, right? Behind this framing of, of science. And, you know, it's a very general, basic kind of science story. So that's, that's what we'll do to start with. Then we're going to move on to, uh, let me start that again. It's here. Uh, parallel size distribution. So there's some good stuff in here. This is great stuff. This is a lot of fun. Um, so just to try and we're going to build up some intuition throughout the course actually on this because it's just something that is so important. And I've sort of realized over time, I mean, I, I went, went through statistical mechanics. There's just tons of this stuff everywhere. But it is, so you get very used to it, but it takes a long time. And I think, uh, I think it's worthwhile, you know, interspersing throughout the course questions about this uh, these so-called parallel size distributions. So we'll explain those things and get excited about them. All right, come on, thing. Don't do that. Okay. Um, what else do I have for you? Okay, so I think sh things should work. No Wi-Fi this time. <laughs> um, evil Wi-Fi, which is right at the bottom of Maslow's um, pyramid now, right? Wi-Fi. First world issue. Um, okay, so I think that's right. So there's an assignment. That's the other thing. Yes. Yeah, that's a good thing to talk about. So your first assignment, code name number one, set phases to stun. It used to be fun, so now it's got a different name. So there's going to be a, a, a data set to play around with, courtesy of our friends at Google who love to uh, go and find things out on the web. And so it's actually from their trawling of the web, you know, setting up all of their databases, of course, they cache all the web pages. And so it's a simple thing from that. It's just counting the words that they come across, which includes brackets and all sorts of things, right? They, they're happy to count the whole thing. So, you know, square brackets actually match up pretty well in terms of total, <laughs> total count. So that's in there, periods, the whole thing. Um, so there's some stuff so that you can download these guys if you've got the PDF up. It doesn't work if it's printed out, of course, but you can click on this. I'm very funny. So you can, you can click on this, uh, and, and you'll get those data sets. Nice to use it in MATLAB. Play around with the MATLAB. You can use whatever you want. But there's a bunch of questions associated with that. And so some of them are you know, just rendering these things, trying to fiddle around with the data. And then there's some just analytic work. Okay. Um, <coughs> the way I tend to structure, and you'll see this as we go through today, the way I tend to structure these lectures is we'll go along, and then there'll be insert qu assignment from uh, insert assignment question. right? So build it up, and then you guys do some suffering, and then Suffering is good. That's a very important part of this course. Something I didn't quite say, I think, the other day that I, I want to say is that this is a course that I think that's in between a normal coursework kind of course where here are the problems, do them. Here's, a, here's one that's kind of like it, do it, you know, that sort of thing, which is very important, right? You need to l learn to throw a ball. You throw it a million times. Um, and research and kind of open research, right, which is a dangerous place to be. It's scary and you don't know which tools to use. And so we're going to use a lot of different things to solve lots of different problems because that is the way it works once you get out there, right? Into uh, the world of pure research. All right. So that's, that's just something I wanted to add there. So, okay. So this is this, this is just some stuff about, uh, about uh, complex systems in general. A few quotes, my kind of framing of the thing. Uh, we'll come back to this set of slides later on. There's some, I have some stuff on emergence and self-organization and so on, right? So <coughs> there's some other pieces that we'll return to as we go through the course. Um, <coughs> so always good to look at words. Um, and sometimes, you know, the origins of words are nice and they help, they sort of agree with where you are and, and, you, and you tell a little story about that and you say how good that is and it doesn't always work out. But um, so... Uh, so to fold and weave, right? So it's a very, so with, with um, weaving, right? That's a very nice idea of tapestry and so on. Uh, so <coughs> this is the basic mission. So it's, a, so it's a, a great framing. I will say, and I don't think I have this in the slides, that there were precursors to this kind of framing. And there were one very famous one was cybernetics. And you know, lots of Nobel laureates involved and so on. 
it's just not a good, it's a very 1950s um, sci-fi robots and so on sort of term. It doesn't really feel very good. I mean, it was about control and that sort of thing as well. So uh, <coughs> you know, this, is a, this is a framing that, you know, we, depending on us, may or may not go away, but I, I don't think fundamentally it should. Uh, some people will make a distinction between complicated and complex. Okay, so we should say this. Uh, there are things that we, this is not entirely true, but things that we've built, of course, which are one could describe as being complicated um, uh, in that, you know, there's lots of moving parts and things that we've kind of engineered to, to, um, to do a certain thing. Now, we'll see that that's not actually entirely true, right? So you can, get, you can end up with these... Um, we have very well-made systems that are not adaptable. And, and we're, we've entered into the age now with computers and so on where we're doing these kind of crazy things with um, building adaptive systems, right? We have all this sort of intuition from evolutionary theory and so on. So we are building these things, and we're trying to do that for, say, on, say smart grids. And I mean, in principle, we do that, you know, with, with, um, with society, right? I mean, you have a free society. It's, you're sort of setting up some rules for a game, and you're hoping that within that game that, that it's adaptable and it changes and it evolves in a good way. Um, <coughs> right? It's not centralized control. Big deal. Uh, so, of course, we can get, we, we've certainly created this, engineered systems that are absolutely um, complex now in the sense that I want to use. Uh, so the power grid is a great example. Power grids around the world are good examples because they were built locally and they were quite good. They work well. You know, they were engineered things. But then they've, they've been connected up over time. And there are lots of business reasons for doing that. And of course, there's always you know, engineers making computations as well about what will work and what won't. But you get beyond the original design. And, and as we've seen, um, and we have Paul Hines here in the complex systems group and in engineering, who's uh, a specialist in this. Uh, yeah, you get these disasters right, that are absolutely unforeseen and, and in some cases very much um, very hard to understand as to, as to the origin. Right, so lots of uh, spectacular failures. Um, <coughs> so we, you, m you will hear some people talk about complex adaptive systems, but I'm happy to talk about just complex systems. All right. Fine, just some words. I'm going to give you a few quotes. This is from the Wikipedia, at least some at some point. So it points out that complex, there's not a single theory. You will hear people say very explicitly the theory of complex systems. And that's not really right. Okay? There are lots of different theories. Um, depending on your system. And one of our battles is to find out how universal certain theories are and, um, and keep ourselves under control when we, when we think you know, our model of magnets will explain how humans behave, which is the kind of thing that does happen with some regularity, right? especially physicists get excited about what they've done. <coughs> I, I'm not, I'm, if you haven't seen this, I'm not kidding. I mean, there are papers on, there are many, many papers that kind of fit into that mold where Here's a model of a magnet, which is totally made up. And here's a model of, now we're going to use it to study human decision making. Um, and this is how you should run the European Union, right? I mean, okay, <laughs> really dangerous. Okay, so, um, so, so this is their point, right? Uh, that as, as at least at some point on the Wikipedia, it was said like this. Um, right, so they're really fun. So it's asking, so it is a framing. It's not quite said here, but it's a framing that's, that's trying to focus us on getting at some really big, big questions. Um, about systems, which are everywhere, absolutely everywhere. Uh, there's a textbook, for there, and I mentioned this one before, by uh, Bokhara, who was a Princeton, I think, when he wrote this. Um, so, no universally accepted definition. Now, this is about definition again. Um, this is just definition, not about a theory. Uh, most people would say it's a uh, you know, system of connected agents exhibits an emergent global behavior, not imposed by a central controller. Very good. Um, but resulting from the interactions between the agents. And so there's, again, this micro to macro idea that the macro is different to the micro. Um, doesn't quite say the word network, right? This is sort of around the time that networks are taking off. Philip Ball, who writes so well, as I've mentioned. Um, <coughs> and he, he attacks this, this a little bit, some, some of the hubris that's floating around. Uh, seeks to understand how order and stability arise in the interactions of many components according to a few simple rules. Well, that's, a, that's, a, that's actually a kind of a physicist um, approach, right? You always want a few simple rules and you tell a beautiful story from it. And that's a very important thing to do. But they're often, they're toy models, usually, and they, they give you a sense of uh, you know, what a few ingredients will do. Um, there's a sort of a horrible thing in between where you start to add more and more ingredients and you're not sure what to do, right? There's the replication of the whole thing. Uh, and this, uh, years ago, we, we invited a bunch of people. This is when I was at Columbia. We had a, a bunch of people come and talk about um, 
spreading on networks, and one of them was Thomas Schelling, and I'll come back to him later on. I've mentioned him already, but uh, he, he gave an example of a friend of his who had, um, so he's a Nobel Prize winner in economics, talking about um <coughs> Uh, modeling uh, planes, right? So you start, so we have good models of fluid flow around simple objects like a ball, and that's really quite hard. It's really quite hard, but we can solve equations and really try to understand it. But you don't then deform the ball into a plane and solve it all the way up, right? You sort of, you have this difficult situation where you can understand the really simple toy versions and you've got to do that, and then somehow from that you go to the big scale. So we're seeing that, of course, now with social phenomena. There are all sorts of models of transportation. There are models of ecologies. There are models of um, uh, you know, how people move around and therefore how diseases get transmitted around the world based on the, the way planes move and so on. And we have lots of data on, on these things. Um, <coughs> but, you know, tricky business. Okay. This guy's funny. Uh, so he was at Santa Fe for a long time. So the, the science of complexity is very much a potpourri, and while the name has some justification, chaotic motion seems more complicated than harmonic oscillation, for instance, I think the fact that it is more dignified than neat nonlinear nonsense has not been the least reason for success. So this is, uh, you know, he's being a, you know, being a bit rude, but it is, um, framing is important, right? And, and, and I, you know, I've done a lot of work on marketing and so on, and there's, there is a good thing about framing things well in, the, in that you represent the knowledge that you've got well, right? Okay. Um, so, and he spent some time at Santa Fe and it didn't help. Now, he was there certainly in the time of before networks and data took off. So, Strogatz, the great Strogatz, right? Um, <coughs> every decade or so, a grandiose theory comes along bearing similar aspirations and usually has a C name. So, there's uh, cybernetics, as I mentioned, catastrophe theory, which Fantastic name. I mean, really exciting. Um, kind of came out of a pure math world, and it did not work out. Chaos theory was everything. That was going to explain everything. But it turns out, yes, there's chaos, but there's a lot of this other stuff, which is called order and replication and why we're not a big soup. Um, but it was a really, you know, really big, big deal. But that, I mean, people started, uh, I remember meeting a guy on Wall Street from Texas who'd started a... Uh, I think I was wearing a suit. I don't know if my wife was trying to get me a job there, but um, it's a long time ago. But yeah, it was like this Texan guy, and it, yeah, it was based around chaos theory. I mean, that was some, and it was completely mad. But um, it's not there anymore. Uh, <coughs> so complexity theories had that sort of thing too, right? So people so uh, understand all sorts of things with complexity theory. But you have to be. This is not quite the right thing to do. There's complex systems, and then there are theories for those complex systems. Um, so, all right, so here's a, here's a reasonable definition. A distributed system, I'm going to say this, uh, integrated, possibly networked, they don't have to be, parts with no centralized control, or limited centralized control, at least, I should say, um, exhibiting some kind of emergent behavior. So the emergent behavior is, is that the, you know, the, <coughs> it's not just, you don't just have some sort of linear thing where the, the, uh, the sum is equal to the, 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 the whole is equal to the sum of the parts, right? That's linear algebra, another thing I teach. So there's a gray framing for this, and you have to think about it a little bit. More is different. And this is a, a paper by Anderson. Um, <coughs> let me risk this by clicking on it. Uh, this is a paper by Anderson in, uh, I, I guess I did this the other day. Go on. Waiting, waiting for UVM. Well, it worked. Um, I, 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 you should read this paper. It's, uh, it gets a little physics-ish in there, but um, because that's what he is, a physicist. He has to talk about um, ammonium atoms, I think it is, ammonium molecules. Um, but, uh, and we'll come back to this later on, but here's his, here's his point, right? So that, uh, that it's not just physicists, and this seems ridiculous perhaps to you, but, but this may, may seem, but the physicists, for a while there, everyone thought they were just doing the applied things, right? The physicists were the only ones doing real science, finding out the, you know, the real truth of the universe. And, and this framing here is that, uh, uh, so this is social sciences, uh, depends on psychology, and psychology depends on physiology, and solid state depends on elementary particle physics, right? So that you go up from level to level to level to level. And the thing that, uh, that was escaping people perhaps a little bit, um, with some of them, is that physics doesn't imply all of this, right? It implies a fair amount of it, but there's a lot of accidents of history and so on that give rise to, as I said, the platypus and other things um, that 
you know, might not be obviously predictable. And, you know, we don't really care that we're made out of quarks, right? So we might really want to start the game of, d of understanding a very basic science thing, which of course is, you know, say from psychology to social phenomena. We start with the rules of some simple psychological behavior and we move to the next one. We don't have to start with quarks. All right, that's a, uh, that may seem obvious to you. Let me get this back to here. Um, <coughs> so more is different. That's the, f that's the framing here. Going up through these scales, you're getting these quite different games. So a different game appears at this next level and you simply have to start again. Uh, and the kinds of approaches you use uh, at different scales may or may not work. Uh, so other pieces that you see, <laughs> this is just very general. Uh, Nonlinear relationships may be obvious, but they may be somehow implicit uh, in network structure. Uh, feedback loops, of course, are quite obvious there. Uh, they can be driven, right? So there's some energy being put into the system. Boundaries are opaque. Memory, obviously a big deal um, in human systems, but all sorts of systems. Uh, and, and this is a big deal. There are just an enormous amount of... Uh, my word, there's just a tremendous amount of work has gone into this modularity and multi-scale structure of, of systems and being able to get that out of a giant networked um, body of data. All right, so there are a few things. This is kind of ridiculous, but complex systems. Yes, I, wa I want to say this, right? There are all sorts of things uh, really fit into this category. Um, <coughs> everything that's basically interesting. And, you know, so the things that we've been able to focus on at different times because the data has become available, um, we've, we've been able to get into, you know, deeper and deeper. Um, and then there are transitions. So astrophysics is a, or astronomy is a great example, right? It's around about 2000 where we go from single observatories and if you're doing your PhD, you get some three or four weeks and you get to look through a telescope if it's cloudy and so on, you're in trouble. But, uh, you know, now we have arrays of telescopes and it's a different game because you have to be data crunching machines, you know. Uh, and, and that just goes up every, whatever it is, five to ten years. You're smiling because you like crunching things. Um, <laughs> that's it, isn't it? Yeah. Um, <coughs> yeah, it's a world you're inheriting. So, um, whatever it is, seven, eight years, suddenly there's an array that's ten times as big as the one before, and the data that's coming in is, is you know, even more gigantic. Uh, I, I'll say this again. I do have it on other slides, but the... Um, uh, you know, the, sup the super collider in, in Europe, which threatens to you know, explode the universe, potentially. <laughs> it's sort of a, you know, unclear about that. Well, the theory suggests no, but I don't know. We could be wrong. Um, it's kind of funny things that they managed to say. Uh, I think they throw, I mean, they know what they're doing, I think, but they throw away, you know, 99 point X percent of the data because they don't need it all. But it's a ridiculous amount of stuff that's coming in. <coughs> And the reason they throw it away is because they can't keep it all. All right. So this is spreading across all fields. I mean, we figured out science at some point. We we're very excited about ourselves. And then we've made all these boxes, which we needed to do. Um, and we still need to have those boxes. But um, people are certainly working across all sorts of fields now. And they need to be to solve some of, particularly some of the big engineering, social um, problems of the day. OK. So here's a little piece that will get us to uh, this manifesto that I keep going on about, which I hope is actually good. So Democritus comes up with the term atom. I just want to sort of put where we are in, in context, right? So this is, this is a while ago. Um, yeah, so Plato allegedly wanted everything that he ever said thrown away, burn everything that he'd written down. Um, so atom, not cut, right? You can't, things that can't be uh, cut open. Of course, we found quarks inside, so, you know. <laughs> but they're, yeah. Atoms are good, uh, good little parts. Uh, so this was not, so, so the idea has been around for a long time. And of course, if you think about physics, we've had some ideas in physics that lasted for thousands of years we were quite sure about. And um, <coughs> people got very upset if you said the wrong thing, you know, um, right? The planet's going around in circles and all sorts of stuff. Um, <coughs> took us a while to figure some of these things out. So we get to much later on and we have uh, chemists figuring out this sort of right, atomic story. Now, you'd think that, that by this point, we've all, we're all, okay, there are atoms, there are all these little bits, and now you've, right, you're right, you measuring the weights of them and so on, so they must be there. But that's not what the physicists were really thinking. They were actually thinking, well, there's still a continuous story underneath it. You're getting some kind of you know, artificial structure, an important one, but um, underneath it, it's a continuum. 
And, and so you know, one of the famous characters here is uh, Boltzmann, who was a depressive character and committed suicide. And it's not entirely because, I mean, just uh, in part of it was his struggles with the, uh, the people he worked with, right? So uh, he had a theory of gases which, which talked, you know, atoms were in this, right? So that, that was his theory. Uh, and everyone else, the philosophers who, you know, are crazy, okay, <laughs> becoming more clear and clear every day with every uh, piece that appears in the New York Times under, under the heading The Stone, um, pretty much. Um <coughs> sorry. Uh, kind of extraordinary, uh, but also scientists, right? So Mark um, and these, they, they didn't believe in atoms. So, you know, there's a, this is a, the turn of uh, the last, so this is a lot of arguing about, of course, quantum appears at this point. There's a lot of uncertainty about what's going on. The ether is still this concept. I mean, really a mess. Uh, so here's, a, here's another piece. These are both taken from the Wikipedia, which is that link. So maybe right or wrong, but Apparently, uh, <coughs> at a conference in St. Louis, he was not, um, not you know, they're, they're, they're sick of him. So they put him off in some horrible thing called applied mathematics. Uh, and then he went off and he's, atta he's attacking the philosophers. And he wanted to become a philosopher, I think, at this point. So he could get in there and, uh, you know, kind of sort them out. But uh, as I said, he, he, he uh, you know, his depression took him. Um <coughs> Anyway, so, uh, and then so his statement down here is he's talking about uh, evolution and inheritance, and he's saying that basically that's happening in science, right? That there's this cultural inheritance and they're terrible and then, yeah. So, so you know, this is, this is a brilliant guy. I mean, absolutely brilliant, one of, you know, one of the great geniuses, and, and, and he's arguing for atomic theory, and this is just, he, this, is, this is only a bit over 100 years ago, right? So we're talking about systems now, and of course we've always thought about them in different ways, but We've only just really gotten out of an era. We had a gold, what I would call a golden age of sorting out the small bits, right? Because once you figure out the atoms, they're the atoms, right? We don't, unless you're in a science fiction thing, you don't get to make up another thing, right? The fundamental constants are what they are, um, unless you're a, uh, Alan Sokal and they can change and you, you're lying. Um, but they, they, seem to be st okay, they seem to be stable. We don't, we're not going to get a new story there, right? So once we figure out the parts, we can look at the way they fit together, and we can also, of course, start to create ways for them to fit together. So there are the atoms, but then there's DNA and genes, right? So that's not far ago in time. But you know, figuring out the, the, the insides, the smallest pieces, uh, big deal. All right, so Einstein appears, and there's, again, a link to these, these papers. Um, so this uh, wonderfully titled piece is about Brownian motion. So he figures out a, a theory for how Brownian motion, this pattern of Brownian motion, uh, which I get brown is the uh, 1800s, uh, uh, could, could arise from molecules or particles hitting each other, right? And so you'll do a little bit of that in some of uh, a problem set, a couple of problem sets. Um, <coughs> Plinko, Plinko, there'll be a little bit of Plinko. Okay, good. If you don't know what Plinko is, then that's okay, because <laughs> you're a good person. Um, <coughs> so this, this was one of his five amazing papers from that year, right, this, this miraculous year. Uh, but it seemed, it demonstrated, at least theoretically, that yes, this all made sense. That, right. And then a few years later, you have a uh, Perrin's experiment that, to show that this all made sense, right, verified that atoms were real. So this is 1908. I mean, it's not very long ago that we seem to be collectively convinced that there are atoms, right? right? We're still unsure about a lot of pieces down in the, uh, you know, <coughs> we, well, we have a lot of description of the, of the, uh, uh, the uh, subatomic particles now, but we, you know, there's still a lot of arguing and craziness and blowing up things to, to find new ones. But, and the Big Bang is still a way off from being understood completely. But, uh, you know, this is not long ago. All right, okay. So here's the, here's the list, and then we'll move on to um, the next piece. So systems are all everywhere. They're, all, you know, they're in all sorts of um, uh, the, the, you know, phenomena. They appear everywhere. Uh, they matter terrifically, of course. Um, much of science is becomes, after this, as I said, golden age of reductionism, much of science becomes, and this goes on seemingly forever to me, how uh, understanding how these things fit together uh, so here it is, golden age of reduction, reductionism, right? Where it's, we've 
we have DNA, we have genes. I mean, we're still you know, moving on. We've got epigenetics now. We're appreciating how things change in a more complicated way. Understanding how people behave. We've been doing that for a long time. We have a lot of trouble with some of those experiments. Social psychologists keep getting into trouble for making up data for 10 years and stuff like that. The Dutch fellow, you know about this? Okay, so just a little side note. There's a fellow in uh, a, a Dutch guy who won Father of the Year at some point. There's a New York Times article, a uh, big magazine piece about this. Spent uh, 10 years just making up data. We had a whole fleet of students and they would give him a data set and so they couldn't find anything and he would give it back and say, oh, you missed this bit. And eventually his students kind of figured out what was going on and, and um, brought it to light. So, um, sorry for this side note. And uh, disaster. So a whole bunch of people lost, ma you know, many of their papers just vanished because they, everything was retracted. So anyway, <coughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's an incredibly important area, right? Understanding us, but uh, it's, a, it's a bit of a fraught one. So we... We have some uh, <coughs> work to do there still. It seems we've got some of these other things, like Adam sorted out. So, so both understanding and creating systems, and this is some of what we do here, of course. Um, <coughs> you can make uh, both the way the things interact, you know, the set up systems for people to interact, um, if you like, or you can create new kinds of atoms, the way they might interact. Uh, especially now that we you know, lift out further and further into the web and, and the internet, Lots of possibilities. Uh, and then there's this, from a basic science point of view, and, and then, of course, from a, the engineering side, uh, universality. We'll come back to this later on. It's a very, uh, from time to time throughout the course. So you have systems that are quantitatively uh, different, right, at the microscopic scale. So fluids are a good example, right? You can have honey and water and air and so on. And that you look at the little guys, they're, they're different, right? They're different things. You can see they're made out of similar bits, but they're different pieces. Um, but put them together and you get this, the same kind of macro behavior, right? Now, you don't want to use fluids to explain the economy, although there were some ingenious uh, machines, right? Uh, built uh, particularly in Britain that where they tried to do this. Um, <coughs> But there are big realms where the same kinds of uh, arguments or, or theories apply. Okay. Uh, and the thing that's, you know, apart from us blowing up things to find out the atoms, right, and repeatedly doing so, um, having great insights about double helices, is that computing has changed the game. I think in one page this is fair enough, right? Um, we can both measure, and so measuring instruments are an extra piece here, but we can record this just fantastic an amounts of data that'll keep going up. And we've got all these areas that are transitioning from data scarce to data rich, and the game is different, right? Just change it. So astronomy was one example. Biology changed, right? Once you started to be able to not just, you know, do parallel kind of experiments and produce tons of data. Um, <coughs> you know, now we have the sort of almost absurd thing of, I don't know, when I went through my graduate you know, degree, I mean, I would go to libraries and pull books off and, you know, and photocopy them. I mean, photocopying is magic as well, but, but now we have, uh, you know, people writing code to scan through papers on, uh, you know, medical papers uh, to find all of the results about particular genes and so on, right? Because you can't read them all, so you start to do this bizarre thing of, uh, of scanning through the data we've produced. All right, <coughs> so lots of different ways this, this works. And of course, so there's just that, but then there's simulating, right? So the simulation, we can um, create and run things in, in uh, increasingly great detail. So, so this makes it possible. And, you know, people could have talked about this for and have, you know, forever, but there's, there's what we tend to end up doing is the things we can measure, they're the things we get excited about, and we can make bad mistakes, actually, of course, that the things we measure are the important things. Right? So, um, I'm all for measurement. The more stuff we can measure, the, the better it is. I mean, some people don't like it. They don't like it at all. They don't like things being quantified. Um, you know, we do horrible things to Moby Dick. We chop it into words, for example, but um, and repack it into a pile of whatever. And you know, look, nutrition's like that right now. You see on the side of a packet, it tells you how, many, how much protein and carb it's essentially just telling you what the atoms are like doesn't really tell you how they're fitting together and what they're doing to you, but it just sort of gives you this almost atomic thing, right? It's like, okay, we just put in a box and, 
and then spat out all the bits and like there are th this many bits and this many bits and this many bits and that's pretty basic. I mean, imagine if someone, you know, here's my friend, they are 73% water, right? I mean, <laughs> right, so much iron in that, right? That, that, <laughs> you should be friends with them because of their makeup. <laughs> They're like your other friend who's very similar, right? So that, I mean, you know, you, you can see this in these different fields, like where they are, right? Where they are and where they are. And, and a good question is, will they all change, right? So ecology is a tricky one. I mean, can we measure animals eating each other, right? I mean, we have s graduate students out there trying to f see who ate whom and writing it down and um, trying not to get eaten as well, become part of the study. Um, <coughs> in the great tradition of graduate students being sacrificed for um, papers. It has changed. We involve them. We, 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 we love our graduates. We involve them. But the, the, uh, you know, the old way was sort of 100 years ago, or in some fields not very long ago, was there's one author, which is the, the big guy, and on page 17 it says, we thank Smitherton, who walked in, <laughs> who, who you know, worked for three months in the, in the fields, and um, we haven't heard from him, but he's <coughs> possibly dead, but did, uh, did all the analysis, actually. Yeah, right. Uh, so, so we've changed a bit there. Anyway, um, <coughs> the game is good. So you can, you can think about the fields you're in, the fields you're working on, you're, right? How much data there is, where is it going, where can it go? And in some, I mean, in a very clear way, I think, physics was easy. Physics was kind of easy. It was incredibly hard, but it was easy. There were things we could measure, and it turns out the math thing works out, which is pretty spectacular. Um, and we, we still argue about why that may or, you know, why that makes sense. There's some famous work on that. We'll come back to that. But now we're getting into the things that are much messier, you know, more probabilistic. We've developed all these tools to, to be able to get at that. And it's a really exciting time because we've made that transition. I talk a lot. Lindsay. Yeah, so which was not appreciated as much uh, until we got too much of it. Yeah, right, right. I mean, it was always like tabulating and organizing data was sort of a, you know, a labor. But now in sorting out the data, you're actually, you're really thinking about what's going on often. And actually, you know, you, you, you half solve your problems by, by you know, sorting it out. Anyway, but the framing was there before. It's just that a lot of systems came online uh, for, for being, you know, open to study. So, so is the complexity part of this, I guess, realm of science just the organizing? Um, or is it the... No, it's a description of the systems. I mean, the syst uh, as I mentioned, the, the systems are complex, right? So that they are, um, yeah, I mean, this definition, right? So there are many interacting parts. Many is a funny word, but you know, many interacting parts, right? And the parts, the way they behave individually in isolation um, are different to the macros you know, the next level up, if you like, right? So there aren't tornadoes sitting inside of uh, water molecules You're or right. people inside of carbon atoms, right? I mean, we have this strange, like the homunculus theory. We tend to go for that sort of thing. It's like, oh, there's a person inside your head that's doing the thinking. Uh, you know, that's, we can't help ourselves. So, I mean, we could just Google this now. It's there, right? Homunculus there, right? It's just like, oops. So the word, you talked about how the word complex is very interesting and how it, what it means. And science is sort of the opposite, right? The idea of breaking it down and putting it into compartments. And well, it has been because we had to do it. We absolutely had to do I it. Mean so that, so I actually I have that later on in, in some later slides. The word science only, the word scientist only appeared in the 1800s, which is interesting, I think. A lot of these ologists and ists only appeared then because we realized we did have, you know, we had to kind of deploy ourselves to get in there and study the bits. So we had to do that in biology. We had to go and figure out all the time, like this. So biology is really hard, right? And it's a, it's the sort of a, a barren ground for, or a, a wrecking ground for a lot of physicists who come in and say, I have a fantastic theory, it will explain all of the, you know, platypuses, right, or whatever, and, and every other animal. But 
it turns out there are lots of little molecules like locks and keys and they're all special and so on. So, you know, there is some tension, of course, between, and we'll see that later on, some, there are some universal patterns or bigger patterns. But um, there are lots of horrible little details that you simply have to go and figure out. There's not this nice sequence of atoms that, you know, <laughs> you can put on a table, right? Where, how do you organize the molecules of living organisms? I mean, you can, but it's hard. This also sounds kind of like um, ecological succession. succession, succession. Like forests, you mean? Like, uh, what sort of thing? Yeah. Civilization, right? Yeah? I mean, that's another... I mean, we have various arguments about what you need to have before you can... Right? And we've made computer games where, you know, you have to chop some wood before you can invent an iPod or something like that. And, uh, you have the kind of, like, Jared Diamond, like, guns, germs, and steel. Like, what needs to be there before you can access the next level up? Um, <laughs> Jared, <laughs> so... We will stop. That's well, well, not yet. Um, <laughs> I'll stop. So, one of the questions I've always had is kind of where does physics and, and complexity start? And let me explain what I mean by that. In principle, if we knew, if let's say we know the governing dynamics of a system, mm -hmm. whether it be an infinite number of gas molecules or let's talk about the universe, galaxies, things like that. If you had enough computing power to solve Newton's laws of motion for all of this, there is no such thing as, no, there's no need for emergent behavior to come out of your simulations. What's that? What's that? Emergent behavior, it's there still. Uh, yeah, it's still, it's, okay. So what happens is that it's, it's weird and mysterious until you understand it, right? And, and so, I, uh, the emergent part is still a, a reasonable term. It's that um, different behavior, qualitatively different behavior is occurring macroscopically to microscopically. And so we can understand, so fluids is really the great example, right? So you can, we can m you know, make up our micro story there or, or the you know, gas um, models and so on. You can make your ma micro story and you get the, the, the macro behavior. Um, so the question is whether you can eventually describe it neatly, or whether you can only simulate it. There might be some things where you can only just simulate it. Well, that's, that's exactly right. I mean, you can write it. In, in principle, you cannot have enough equations to fully describe right. the system. I mean, in, that's why I said philosophically, it right. seems like everything should be deterministic. Oh, that part. And this is interesting. People like determinism. Equations, right? Yeah, but... Uh, well, there, there, I mean, there, there are a couple of parts there, right? I mean, there's, there's, there is this chaos theory thing, right, where you have extreme divergence but possible. So even if you do know everything, um, very subtle changes can lead to big changes. So there's that. And then there's, then there's quantum, hashtag quantum, right? So that, 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 that really messes things up. Um, I mean, <laughs> then we have all sorts of things with us, right? And so we still have this kind of crazy thing where there's no free will and... I'm saying this because it was all preordained, you know. It's like a fringe episode or something. But um, <laughs> <laughs> but it's I so I, I think I think also as you couple up from systems that even if it's deterministic down here, the thing that's bubbling out of it, the thing that the signals that are being used by this next level up are effectively random. I've had these arguments with Danforth actually. They're, they're effectively random enough so that the perception. So that's, so that's statistical mechanics, right? So, so the weird thing is, and I'll say this again, the weird thing is that people like Maxwell and so on, they were, as I understand it, inspired by what people were doing with studying people. So actuarial kind of tables of how many people are going to be kicked to death by a donkey this year. Turns out, you know, like they'll predict, they were predicting and so on. And, and this was weird because it was, of course, you couldn't say who, but you, you could write down it, you could estimate it. Um, so they could start to create kind of these probabilistic descriptions of social, like some aspect of social behavior. And they took that over and used that to describe, because um, they, they couldn't do this, right? They couldn't exp describe all of these atoms. So they, 
actually make a probabilist it's, it's a probabilistic description at a small scale, which is OK enough. So yes, even if it was all deterministic, effectively that next scale up, it's probabilistic enough so that then you can couple all that together to get the macro story. W you're matching up with it, yeah. I feel it's a trap, but <laughs> no. you can trap me. Uh, you're you're going to trap me. That's what you're OK, so is that OK? Yeah, OK. Um, so um, all right, so there's a manifesto. All right, fine. Uh, but it's a really, really exciting time, right? It's a really exciting time. Fields keep changing and uh, producing tons of data. And of course, the thing for us now is social phenomena, I think, which is coupled to so many different things. I mean, you know, if you're in engineering, there are lots of the social coupling of engineering products is enormous, right? Whether things will even just spread, you know, whether people will like it, right? You make the BlackBerry, and it's a really got some great insides and everything. But um, you know, it turns out that you know the, these other guys turn up with this nice little glass thing, and it's just really fun to use. And humans show other humans, and they say, "Look, look at my thing," and the other humans put their Blackberries in their back pocket. <laughs> and whether you could say no, but it's got better insides. It's you know the humans, the humans. All right, <coughs> have to understand humans. When I say human, so I'm trying to be funny, okay? So we always, we always, um, <laughs> we always notice when someone says, uh, when they start to talk about people as humans. So <coughs> for the greater good, right? Yeah. <coughs> that's, when it, that's when it goes wrong in a movie or a show, right? The bad guy always says, it's for the greater good. Okay. All right, so let's do a little, uh, let's do a little, a little, uh, I don't get you to exercise your physical selves too much, but I, I want you to, um, Test your intuition about these these power law size distributions I've been talking about. All right, so money is money's a weird thing, right? So it really is, and uh, I don't understand economics at all. But uh, I it took me a long time to sort of grasp some p parts of it. But money is a social construct, right? I mean, ultimately it is. We took the gold thing away, and so we don't even have that. But it's in our heads. I mean, someone I buy a banana and I hand that person whatever fifty whatever it is. Um, you know, if you're at Trader Joe's or something, 60 cents for a banana in a plastic bag. Um, and, and we all believe that was fair, right? We might have some quibbling and some haggling, and depending on our cultures, but that, you know, credit cards, credit, it's a belief card. It's a belief card. It'd be better to call money belief. I will have three beliefs. Anyway, that's a sort of a side thing. Um, okay, but let's talk about money writ large. So I have a couple of questions for you, and I want you to just write down your answers and then I'm going to hand around a piece of paper, and you must copy what you wrote onto them without caring what anyone else did. <laughs> it's very important, because that's bad. And, um, and you shouldn't take too long. Just do this. And, I, and I'll show you the results later. You know, we'll come back to it. So, um, and it's anonymous, so I don't know what that means you will do. But it, it, yeah. Uh, so, so the first one is, um, what do you think? So let's think about the wealth of individuals in the US and put them into quintiles. So we're going to order the wealthiest person to the least wealthiest person. So we'll take the first 20%, add up all of their wealth, the next 20%, add up all of their wealth, and the next 20%. And then the question is, what fraction of all of the wealth is in the first quintile? What fraction of the wealth is in the second one? What fraction is in the third and fourth? And then what do you think you believe it should be? Which can be based on your, you know, how you want to, for the greater good kind of vision of the world. And so the extremes, of course, will be 100, 0, 0, 0, right? The top 20% has all of the wealth and no one else does. And 20, 20, 20, if it's a, you know, completely egalitarian, just so you have the right pattern, right? Sometimes people make these numbers go up, but they should also add up to 100. <laughs> that doesn't always happen when I send <laughs> this around. This kind of yeah, just copy on that. So write it down and then on whatever device you have, some of you have paper still. And then just be honest. Yeah, that's all right. So it, it doesn't take long, like 30 seconds. So what do you think it really is? What do you think it should be? Good? Morgan, what are you doing? What? Done? So 
this, is no, this doesn't define the rest of your life. Just, just a tiny little thing, okay? All right. No one knows what you will have done. <coughs> Everyone good? Yeah? Okay, it's not a test. <laughs> okay, so let's see. So there's a, a very nice piece of work, because this is an odd question to ask, right? It's a bit hard to think about quintiles. It's a little tricky. Uh, and this was work that was done by um, Mike Norton and Dan Arely. I don't know quite how to say his name probably, but yeah, right? And Norton, so I met Norton years, a few years ago. Uh, he's at um, Harvard Business School. I gave a talk there, and he's a, he's a nice guy. He's, one, he's actually one of the first wave of uh, people coming through there that really do serious research, I think. Um, probably get zapped for that, but it is actually true. Yeah. So this is what they found. Uh, so this is a you know, survey of some group of people, and there's a link here. You can go to it. Um, <coughs> paper was building a better America one wealth quintile at a time. So this is the actual breakdown of, this is the quintile breakdown. This is a nice way to represent it. So this is 80% uh, here. So it's 85% uh, of wealth is owned by the top 20. And then uh, that's about uh, 10 is owned by the next 20. And then about five is owned by the next 20. And then the bottom 40% is here. Okay, so not so much. Um, this is what, th so that's the actual one. This is what people estimated, right? So they, you know, they definitely had a skew. They gave, they gave the bottom 40%, you know, a good chunk as compared to essentially zero. Um, and then, and it was also, of course, increasing. And then the ideal is this, this is from Americans, by the way. I mean, from United States, isn't, this is in crazy, crazy sort of thing. This just shows you in some ways how it, it's a difficult thing to think about. But 32% or something like that for the top 20, the bottom 20 having almost over 10%. How is that? What do you think your, so that was the second question, is what do you think the world should be like? If you, could, if you were in charge of the. So it's, you know, it's one of these. We could look it up. It's 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 you know it's is it, is it students? We could check. Have you seen the animated uh, graphic video of this thing? Oh, that's true. There's a nice. That's well done. It's a bit longer, isn't it? Yeah, uh, it's like five, five, ten minutes. Maybe, maybe I should. Um, <coughs> I forgot about that. Yeah, which is a completely separate piece of work, right? Someone got excited about it. Yeah. All right. Well, this is you know, for fun, it might get you upset. I don't know. Um, let me write that down. Yeah, video of Norton. Uh, so they say it's a nationally representative online sample of respo um, respondents. This is what, what they claim, right? I mean, there are you can pay people to pay uh, organizations to get you a bunch of people um, to answer your questions, and it's tricky, obviously, because it's online. So they actually have to get to people who are not online. So very good. You know, some some places can do this uh, well, but you have to pay money. Is that okay? Yeah. yeah. So it wasn't it wasn't um, first year psych students. Which you know it's okay, but they might have a they, you you could expect them having a different thing, right? First year economic students would have a different one as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. So you've been through this. Yeah, I expect you guys to do pretty well with this, but still, I Lindsay. I was wondering, like, why, why ask people their ideal? You don't even know if that's like, possible or sustainable. Well, just to see what they would say. And so that's true. This is even more, I'm pretty sure, and it's hard to even understand, but this is much more egalitarian than Scandinavia, I think, yeah. which is the, you know, yeah. right. So, um, so that's pretty weird. <laughs> It just shows you we don't very have a very good handle on these sorts of distributions. I, I, I think that was the, you know, I think if this was sort of revealed as a society, it might not be what people think is great either. But it just, it just was such a confusing thing. So, all right, don't change your things. Um, <coughs> some interesting, they dug into it a little bit. So, this is, I know this is a bit hard to read. I'm not sure why it came out like this. But um, these are, uh, so the actual one is again up the top. And these are estimated ones and ideal ones in groups. And then it's broken into a couple of things. So this is by wealth. 
So these are people with incomes less than 50, uh, 50 to 100, greater than 100K. And so you see they don't change much, I g is really the story here. They're not very different. The wealthier people were, the more, you know, the more skewed they made it. So that's reasonable. Uh, this, uh, they used people who voted for, they asked people who voted for Bush or Kerry to get an idea of their you know, political leaning. So uh, <coughs> actually, so these are, these are, this is again, this is estimated. So this is Kerry's uh, voters, so presumably left wing versus right wing. They're actually a little more skewed. Uh, women versus men, uh, again, estimated. And then the ideal one, all of them are shifted back here, right? So Bush versus Kerry is, is a little more skewed for the Bush side. Um, it's a little more skewed for, again, for the, you know, the wealthier people would sort of think this was better as well. Um, men had a stronger thing than women as well. Morgan. Well, so that, yeah, that is, I don't know, um, I can't tell you offhand if, if they did a test for that, but the, the, that's the point of this, is that they're, they, they move a little bit in a reasonable kind of way, right? Yeah. Um, you know, wealthier people think it should be a little more skewed, but not, you know, this, these are not completely different, which is, you know, another possibility. Part of it is the framing of the question kind of throws people a little bit. Yeah, you know. uh, it's just hard to think about these kinds of distributions. It really, it really is hard. They yeah. So yeah, I know. I think they were trying to, <laughs> yeah, mess you up completely. Um, was it Cameron was talking about what's the so it's decile and was one twentieth? What's one twentieth? Does anyone know? The Latin, the Latin word. No, this is the V. Is it Vantiles or something? Oh my God. Okay, I'm showing my silliness. All right. Um, okay, so that's this is a this is a this is a strange result. This is actually from the last time I gave this course, which was just actually last spring. So this is what people. <laughs> these were their estimates. So there were you know there's a range, right? Again, anonymous. Right? There's a range, but some people thought. It went from really quite extreme situation to um, to something that's not. Yeah, this was way way off the actual one, which is fine. Um, <coughs> but pretty tough for a bunch of college students, I got to tell you. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, and I was happy to uh, <laughs> leave evidence of that. <laughs> yeah. I know if you had something you could color in, maybe it would work, but that, that uh, yeah, so some things went wrong here too. And then the ideal one, this, yeah. So, so, <laughs> so, so if you have a revolution that you're trying to run, you, you, you had a few, you had a few uh, willing volunteers here. <laughs> Scary differences, yeah. I wonder who did this. Anyway, so <laughs> we'll see. All right. So I'll put yours up as well. We'll see how it goes. For the actual one, did you take the average of all the guesses? Uh, that is of, of for the top one. Oh, uh, for the one slide before. Yeah, that's an average. Of, I mean just a dopey average, I guess. Yeah. Oh, the top line's the average of all. Yeah. It's not the actual one, right? No, it's not the not the actual one, right? Yeah, the actual one goes to yeah here and then here and then the third quintile was here and then nothing. I, I could cut that out and put it there. <coughs> That's the next step, evolution of the brain. Yeah. Fun. All right, good. Okay. Um, all right, so let's talk about parallel size distributions. And I've got some other examples of these things as well. But we'll, we'll talk a little bit about words because words are sort of a fun example, right? Um, <coughs> so... This is just a, so lots of things about systems. There's how thing, and we talked about this in the first day, you know, how things scale, uh, whether they fall apart, all this sort of So let's look at the parts. This is just looking at parts of many kinds of complex systems. Uh, and it depends how you view them. For networks, it might be how many friends a node has, for example, it might be its size, right? You could think about it like that. Um, organizations, so I'll give you some examples of these things. Um, so, this is, the, this is the form of, uh, this is what we mean when we say parallel size distribution, x to the minus gamma. There are other kinds of distributions that 
and we'll get to that later on that could be involved here, but this is one that appears often in real systems that we have great handles on, th you know, theoretical models, lots of physical systems, uh, but also these more complex ecological, social information, all sorts of things. So it's an inverse parallel size distribution. This x to the minus gamma, there's some, and I use this kind of squiggle to mean it's a sort of approximate. There's typically some minimum scale, right? So if we're talking about earthquakes, there's sort of a minimum earthquake size. And there's, one, there's a minimum one that we actually measure and care about. And then there's a minimum one that kind of happens, which I guess could be like a grain of sand or something. But um, there's a maximum size typically as well. And we'll come to this later on, but gamma is greater than one, okay? Oh, okay, I guess I have that choice. So s see if you can sketch that function. We'll come to that later on. Let's not do that yet. Um, you can doodle it if you want. So there's a lower, we talk about lower cutoff and upper cutoff. These are the, just the words, x min, x max in this case. Um, and then the nice thing is that if you take uh, a log of this thing, right? Log of both sides, log 10, and we'll use 10, uh, log 10 of uh, the probability distribution here. So we. Okay, it's a probability distribution. So what we're doing is we're, we've got all of these things in a box and we pick one out. Re and we're not thinking about its size, right? So we've got all the words that appear in Moby Dick and we pick one of them out. Um, uh, and the probability that it appears, you know, so many times in Moby Dick, well, I'll come back to that, is, um, you know, it, it, right? So V, for example, just appears once in your box. Right, and you pull. If you pull the out, it has a huge number next to it, and that's the, that's in a sense its wealth, its size. So it's very unlikely you pick it out. If you do, you get a big surprise. All right, so log log. <coughs> um, so it's a simple thing. So we have a product there. So it becomes log ten of c minus gamma log ten of x. Right, the gamma comes down here. So this is linear now. Right, so log of p is linear in log of x. Good. So we're very excited about that. So lots of lots of log plots. We use base 10 because we are good people. You should always do this. Some people will like to have their natural logs because of the math thing, but you should not do that, right? It's like five of these digits. We, we, um, it's just something that's become a good rule of thumb for us, okay? Decades, right? That's how we measure things. Uh, in engineering, you talk about orders of magnitude, meaning powers of 10, right? So we do that, we do that. Um, so, this power law decay, it's the statistics of surprise, basically. Right? We'll have the statistics of boringness and the statistics of surprise. Because you're sampling from this thing and nothing happens, and then, oh my god, it's enormous, right? So, um, so usually, let's be clear about this, usually it's the tail, right? It's just the tail. There's some other structure and the, the tail has this behavior. Um, so we'll see it's a bit, a bit of an odd thing. So we talk about power law size distributions, people will talk about fat tail distributions, heavy tail distributions, which seems a little you know, wrong, I suppose, but um, physicists are callous people. Um, <coughs> so we'll say power law size distributions. Right. Uh, so they're not the only ones. As I said, there are log normals, there are Weibull distributions, there are all sorts of other nasty things that you know, can be generated from decent mechanisms that may fit your system. Uh, what's happened in the last 20, 30, 40 years is that people love this thing. They find them everywhere, even when they're not there. So, so don't, don't, you know, they're not everywhere, but they are pretty general. Okay, so here's an example um, for word frequency. So, so there are lots of things that have discrete sizes, right? Just how many times the word the appears, how many times the word whale appears, right? Uh, and you know all, all sorts of things, the number of friends you have, that's tricky because you might want to start weighting that by how good the friends are. That's a hard problem that we, a lot of the early work in complex networks certainly you know, just ran over the top of. Uh, the number of links, hyperlinks, what a funny word. Uh, the number of links between, uh, you know, from page to page, that sort of thing. Um, number of citations for articles. Again, you know, something that on the next level you need to weight it. You know, is this just a ridiculous citation? Like networks are interesting, one through thirty. You know, your citation is twenty-seven. That happens, or is it? You know, I'm really referencing that paper. Uh, court decisions this is a really nice work on the Supreme Court decisions. Looking back, so there, you know, lots of things have discrete. We still have that same structure. Um, P of k decays as k to the minus gamma. There's a minimum and maximum typically. 
this uh, explodes horribly for k equals zero, just like x equals zero. So typically there's some range. All right, fine. Okay, so here's a little example. Um, words. All right, so we have the of and to a in that. Uh, these are all the, so an amazing amount of words um, in, in any corpus are really made up of just a few of them, right? So this is about, what is it? So it's eight, so it's almost 20%, the first six words, 20% <coughs> of the words. So if you're writing an article, actually, right? So my wife's a journalist, so she, she'll get paid, you know, so many, whatever, dollars or, you know, coconuts per, per word. Let's say coconuts to keep it fairly independent of what it really is. Um, Per word, which is odd, right? So, she, you know, she, as you will get paid a tremendous amount of your money will come from writing the word the a lot. <laughs> just the, and of, and and, and to, but it's just the nature of language. And you'll have a few exciting ones in there that actually tell you what's going on. They're the ones that really matter, but all this connective tissue is, is uh, really important. Um, so this is the first 15. This is further out. Uh, this is just the, you know, the kind of thing that happens as you get further and further out, you see more and more unusual words, but that's still a pretty reasonable thing. Um, you know, looking through Twitter and Google and so on online. Oh, thank you. I trust everyone was good. Thank you. All right. Um, you know, once you get past 50,000 words, you start to get into lots of spelling mistakes and gibberish and all sorts of things. Um, okay, so here's a there's a lot of fun things to play around with. Here's a piece by uh, Jonathan Harris, who's been up here in various ways, and uh, he's done a lot of different interesting stuff. I wonder if this will still, still work. I think so. Yeah. Is it Java? So this is a, so right, so here's this distribution. Yep. And you can go and find a word. Hopefully nothing bad happens. It's pretty, it's beautifully done, really. So. Click here, and we're at it. Now we're out at uh, 61,000. I mean, there you go. Inconclusively, it's a good word. Um, McClintock appears, right? I mean, it's just, just the texture of. This could it could be a horrible thing. Okay. Yep. There you go. Thank you, humans. Thank you so much. Um, so you go from about 150 words. We'll give you 50% of all the words, right? Done. And then you've just got tons and tons of words. Sticking out there. So that's a fun thing to play around with where if you want. Where did these counts from? Yeah. You know what he did? I just want to say, uh, where did he get it from? I can't remember where he got it from. It's a, it must be a, you know, a web crawl or something. But the other thing he did in here was he searched, he, he, uh, he looked for the words people search for. I mean, he recorded that. So of course people search for the things you, well, you're probably thinking of the words that they search for. So, so he made an extra little piece out of that, which was, you know, humans. <laughs> All right, so that's a fun thing. That's a lovely thing to play with, and it gives you some feeling of, of how all, all of this works. Um, the, word, the, the term here will be zip, right? This fellow zip. We'll get to zip. Zip is here on the zip is here on the list down here. So we have to get to zip in a little bit. But we're talking about these frequency distributions, right? You randomly select an object from a system, and then see how big it is. So we're going to randomly select a, one of the unique set of words in, in a book and see how many times it occurs. All right. OK, so this is a, the statistics of boringness is uh, the Gaussian, right? We have a beautiful story for this, the central limit there is fantastic. And it appears all over the place. Um, just, I mean, it's, and it's, you know, it's a non-trivial equation, right? This is a pretty excellent thing. So you'll get to that one, actually, because if it's a nice thing to do, right? Derive the normal distribution. You can get to it from ball bearings and bouncing off of uh, through pegs and so on. Um, gamma functions, things like that. A little Stirling's approximation, good, you know, hardy stuff. Um, and, and you can, yeah, you can derive this. OK, so uh, this is, this is uh, normal space. This is just one example. And this is, then we're going to use because I talked about the double log thing. So this is the, the double logarithmic space here for the Gaussian. So, it, you know, it doesn't, it, it messes it up, but it doesn't, uh, you know, it's not a complete disaster. It's not absurdly different. The thing about a Gaussian and many other distributions is there's a characteristic size wherever it's centered. So this one has got an average of 10. You sample from this thing, you get 10, you, you know, you're near 10. There's plus or minus 
couple of sigma, that's where you expect to be, right? So if you build your economic models out of it and so on, then that's fine until you get an eight sigma event because it's not really this distribution. Arbitrage, all right. So, okay, if you want, if you want, you could try to sketch this thing. I think I'm just going to jump, but you, I mean, see if you could draw this thing down. Let's go from one to 10 to the six. What, what does that look like? Okay. I'm using Q in a funny way. That's true, it shouldn't be Q. Um, <laughs> Just get in your head what you think this should look like, all right? It's in your head? It's in your head, right? Just one over Q squared. It's over, and the point of this is it's over six orders of magnitude. All right, so what it looks like is this. This is for the brown corpus. So this is, um, so V is right out here, right? So V was six point something, that's how many, right? So there's one word, so this is the frequency. There's one word that appears about that many times. Then there's an, and there shouldn't, I guess there should be speckled dots here, but there's one word that appears, you know, whatever it was, three or four percent, and then it's of. And then they start to bunch together. Right? And then there are a ton of words that appear once. Right? So there's some very funny feel to this. There are a lot of, so we'll see later on that half of, half of the, if we, we just take the words, the unique words, typically half of them appear once. Right, in, in, in you know, a given corpus, a book or a language or whatever it is, um, but usually it has to be some sort of hermetically sealed thing, like so, you know, say a, say a book, a good enough uh, corpus, and that is so hapax legomena, right? There's actually a ridiculous term for that. So the words that appear once, um, <coughs> sort of thing. Borges was really excited about, I think. So all right, okay. So uh, but take this, put it on a double log plot. And we start to see all this nice stuff, and we feel like this is the idea of a fat tail, right? This is, it's not, it's not very, it's pretty thin. This is a very thin thing, right? But we put on a log log plot, and we kind of trick ourselves a little bit, and we feel like that, and it is a heavy tail, right? Gaussians don't do that. Exponentials don't do that. If you put them on a double log, they still go boom, right? which we saw before. So this lifts up. So there's actually room under here. There's actually room under here. It doesn't look like it really doesn't look like it. It looks like most of the stuff is here. And it's true, it is, you know, it is skewed, and it, this is the, you know, the mode thing is back here, but there's room outside under this tail. Tail lifts up when we look through it, look at it the right way. Um, <coughs> so this kind of distribution, uh, the Gaussian distribution, you sample and sample and sample from it, you never really get anything big, right? So if you take a million of them, 10 million samples, 100 million, and you look at the maximum, it grows really, really slowly, logarithmically. It's a beautiful, actual, uh, beautiful part of statistics, actually, but the extremal statistics. But this guy, take 100 samples, 1,000 samples, ten th so you'll do this, 10,000 samples, you get bigger ones. You still might be getting lots of little ones all the time, lots of little ones, and then boom, you know, there's a bigger one, and then there's a boom. Uh, we have that kind of, we, we frame it in, in a certain way, the 100 year flood, the 1000 year flood, the 10,000, we, we do actually, you know, have a common way of talking about that. Um, usually we complain that the 1000 year flood comes every three years, right? So <laughs> we've got it all wrong. <coughs> uh, so this thing will be important. And wow, I'm going to talk about this on Tuesday, I guess. Um, I'm one of those people who monologues. Okay, so... Um, Exceedance probability. So this is this is the same thing, but now we're same data set. But now we find, find the number that have at least uh, that that appear at least Q percentage, Q percent, right? So it is a we'll, we'll write it down a little bit, but it's a um, so the cumulative, right? We integrate up to a point. This is integrating from that point onwards. So it turns out that, <coughs> and we'll come to it. What it does is on the log log plot, you still get a, a nice straight line which is the thing we expected from this, but it's actually cleaned up, right? So integration smooths things out is what's going on here. So this is a bit messy, and if you try to draw a straight line through this and get a, this exponent gamma out of it, right? So the minus gamma is going to be the exponent. We had basically P is proportional to minus gamma times log of whatever our quantity is, that kind of structure. 
um, then uh, that's a little bit nasty. And so, right, there are, there are points out here, and there's a lot of fighting about how to do this well. And, uh, you know, okay, statisticians get upset. So, draw a straight line through here. This is good. This is good. Okay, so now this is, a this is a different kind of distribution, so we'll have to connect those two, but we'll, we'll come back to that. That's this uh, section here, complementary cumulative distribution functions. So not, comp not cumulative distribution functions, but complementary ones. Um, <coughs> this is something you can also play around with. It's kind of out of order, I guess. But um, now we have a sense of this weirdness of words. Uh, we're not going to do this whole thing, but here's, a, here's an example. You can play with this later on. So you could ask someone, you give them 100,000 words, and then if they know them or not, that, this, if you want to figure out if you want to figure out what your vocab size is, present yourself with 100,000 words and answer them, right? Yes or no. So, so how do you sample well from this? So the idea of this is here's a here's a an interesting sample um, that's lower down in the these are more common, right? There's no the and so on, but these are let's say we know all these guys, right? But it gets a little trickier as we move out. So this is taken based on these power law. Uh, distribution structure based on that I want to click enough should have done this before I guess. so we know most of these right gets a little tricky towards the end Pule anyone Bueller Seneca Chereen Chereen no Dagger we're going to say that one Sapling, yes. Turin, yes. right? Bloat, yes. yes. Verdure, yes. good. Seneca, yes. no? Yes. yes? We got a yes? All right, we got a yes and a pure. Well, let's say we know that. Okay, and then that's pretty good. We're pretty smart. Then you get this. This is much bigger. But now it's further out in the distribution. And it will give you an estimate, so you'll have to spend some time on this one. Um, funambulist? Does anyone know? What's that? It's a tightrope walker, I think. There's some good words. Oxoricide? That's not good. That's wife. Um, getting rid of your wife. Um, a neuromancy? I think this is dream prediction. I think so. Anyway, so lots of good words in there. Um, so the person who knows all the words at UVM is Jacques Bailey. Do you know Jacques Bailey? Professor Bailey was in you do. Spelling. Yeah, so he's the guy who asked the questions on the spelling bee because he won it in, he's in uh, classics. Right? He's a Latin Greek scholar and he uh, won it in 81 or 82 with uh, elucubrate, which means to study into the, into the no to burn the midnight oil. Um, so there's pictures of him jumping up and down. But he's the, he's the guy who gives the measured, some, sometimes humorous. Uh, he's only a killer on the bee. So he did this and I think he got 42 or 3,000. So. Um, if you can beat that, then you're good. All right, so there's a fun little thing. Um, <coughs> obviously, we're talking about these things. So we're going to talk some more about this stuff on Tuesday. I think we're, it's not a bad place to end. And we'll do some, we'll, we'll do some math and we'll figure out how these things start to connect to, e to each other. And then you'll do some math to figure out more things. Okay. All right.